And I was wearing a little to replace lab coat with my name on the pocket and matching high heels. And people came from all around CES to see the lady programmer. Felt like a zoo animal. Anyway, at Atari, I had, even though I look back at Atari games, which some of you may do, they seem so innocent and simple, I, I had started to be really disturbed by the violence I was seeing in video games and computer games. And that's, over the next 15 years of producing and, and working with video game artists and companies, I became more and more disturbed about it. Um, I thought I decided to try something different. And so I had seen this little reality demonstrated by a friend when I had an anti research lab started being stopped and shit. And I was really blown away. This was the old dream vector graphics day, but it was still amazing. Uh, so I put him on the federal money, talked to Scott into leaving NASA. We started a company to do virtual reality and telepresence research. And the good news is we had a great team and great ideas. The people who were working with us were, well, people we'd seen before in various labs and people that we would see again throughout our lives as some of the brightest and best in Silicon Valley. Here's the problem. There was no economy for virtual reality in 1989. The systems were incredibly expensive. Um, you couldn't even use one in this amusement park because you'd need at least five minutes well time for each customer who didn't have any sense of what was going on, and even that didn't make economic sense. Part of the problem was that our funding was coming from overseas, and so we didn't get that kind of, you know, we get bad things about venture capitalists sometimes. They did not yell so much. But a good venture capitalist or a social investor will help you find the right people to run the company and help you think about what, what the business plan is, where the market is. And most of the time, they'll find you a good CEO if you're not one. One of the biggest mistakes you can make in business, or even in a collaborative team, is, is to make yourself the boss if you're the designer. You want somebody else running the business. And you want to do your job. 
So we build a team around us with the design of what you're doing that can take care of everything. Don't make the mistake of thinking that you can be the CEO unless that's who you've been trained to be. I was really fortunate to be one of the first research scientists at Interval Research Corporation. This was founded in ooh, 1992 by Paul Allen, who is the other Microsoft billionaire. Um, and he founded Interval as a lab with the mission of coming up with something as different from personal computers, so different from personal computers, that it would open home markets uh, that were just as interesting as personal the cool thing was that he hired David Liddell to run the place, a great, wonderful Renaissance man. And, and then David gathered together a bunch of us who were sort of overaged for the business anymore. I mean, by the age of 40, we were an old part um, in the business in those days. And it was pretty fun stuff. So, um, but these older people who really had the wisdom of their years in, in the computer business got together. Uh, just to explore new topics and new ideas. And that's how we came to the notion of looking at technology and girls, because my boss, David Dell, and I both shared a concern about that. It's a computer lab at the same time that Interval was starting. Uh, you can see all the boys are in front, and, and all the girls are not in the picture. Um, and as we learned more about this problem, we learned that in those days, if you can put yourself back there, the girls were afraid to touch the thing. They were afraid they'd break it. They were afraid they'd do something wrong. They were afraid that they'd be violating a gender taboo against one that being smart and bad in technology. The same one I ran into in 1966 was alive and well in 1992. And you're fortunate that that is fading. But keep your eyes out because it still works in many corners of our lives. So the first thing we try to do is to figure out the right research questions. Why? Why are there computer games for girls? Well, that's too easy because nobody's made it dumb, right? Actually, somebody made one. It was really stupid, but I won't go into it. Another question was, well, what kind of game, computer games for girls play? Again, duh. How, how do we know since they don't play them? Um, you can go out and do research, but I guarantee you your audience is not going to tell you what it is you have to design. If you'd asked a kid in 1957 what kind of toy they would want it, uh, no one would have said, I want a plastic hoop I can rotate around my hips. You know? The hula hoop came out of the mind of the guy who was running Wham-O Toys when he had observed kids doing jump rope and the kind of dance moves that were popular during the day. So he couldn't ask them what kind of computer games they wanted because they had had no examples. And again, your audience probably can't describe the product they'd really like to you in any great detail. So finally we came to this question, how do girls play? Because if we're talking about playing games, playing video games, then the patterns of play are to obtain. Uh, and that is the question that got us the farthest in our research. We interviewed a thousand kids and 500 adults in eight different cities. We worked on this project for almost three years doing the research piece of it. Uh, we were looking at and specifically the notion of how we might make an intervention for 8 to 12 year old girls that would attract them to put their hands on the technology because we knew that once they got comfortable with it, um, they would be empowered then uh, and, and be standing on equal footing with the boys among them. I'll give you uh, an important idea here. When you're doing the gender studies, is really harsh. Okay. Uh, you say girls tend to do this, boys tend to do that, somebody's going to be mad at you because they're not that person. Uh, most of the differences between us, among us, among the many genders that there are, <laughs> are culturally uh, constructed differences. But I know from my research that some of our differences are biological. For example, boys tend to be taller than girls, right? Girls tend to have more trouble with mental rotation under time pressure, it turns out. Girls tend to do better than boys with adamantic under time pressure, it turns out. Girls tend to be body centric navigators, which is why we usually turn them upside down. Now, when I say tend to, I'm talking about the people at the big homes on those curves, those distribution curves. So there are always going to be people, plenty of people, 
We don't follow the average model. So don't get all excited about that part. This is not a census dream. It's not a superficial generalization. Here's one of the fun things we did in our interviews. We try to figure out what is it about a toy or a game that tells a child what brings for a boy or a girl. So our first object was the pink fuzzy toy. And the boys hated it and the girls loved it. And so what we learned was the pinkness and fuzziness were more important than toughness in the hierarchy of gender signal. Okay, so now we're looking, like, okay, so girls in these days had diaries, dear diary. And boys wouldn't go near them, so we thought, what if we turn this into a war journal and put bullet holes in it? And we showed it to boys and they said, uh huh, that's a diary. <laughs> so bullet holes and war journal are not enough to override the female signaling of a diary in 1992. There's another one. A dolphin with blessed fangs. Echo the dolphin was a popular game in those days, and there was kind of a slamming dolphin looking at it on the cover of the game. So we just put fangs on it with blood dripping. And the boys said, I gotta play that game. That game is for This turned out actual reality was one of the few games that girls liked in those days. So blood and teeth override smiling dolphin and our gender. Here's my favorite. This is the toy that nobody wanted. You ready? Yeah, hair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 with the guy in a pants outfit, right? And the boy said, I need that hair. And the girl said, I need that gun. And everybody said, oh, look at those creepy blue eyes that are there. Oh, but So that was kind of satisfying to me as a person who's never been very pleased with Barbie as an idea. Anyway, the company we ended up with was called Purple Moon. And it was dedicated to age 12 year old girls who tried to build computer games, a website, and other stuff. For that issue. And here's one of the biggest mistakes I ever made in my life as a kind of university that was self inflicted. I went to the a development group in San Francisco that was all women, and they had pretty good technical credentials. And I thought, let's hire them. They're going to understand our mission here. They're going to understand that we want to lift girls up, we want to get them involved in technology, and that we want to follow some other findings in our research. So I'll talk to you about in a second. So I hired this one. That's called reverse sexism. I used the stereotype to believe that because we were all sisters, we were going to have the same notion of, of what her mission was. It turned out to be utterly untrue. I was dealing with people with a very large and very different political agenda than mine. It took me a year to discover this, to move them off the team, to give them another team in. That's the year to market, and that's the year that made the difference between success and ultimately failure of my company. Because in that year, Barbie fashion designer hit the shelves. In companies, you'll notice when you work in them, your parents may talk to you about this. There are differences that always happen between marketing people and design people. So here the marketing person is saying, well, you can't talk about that in your game. One of our games is, is about a, a young girl named Veronica who's getting through her first day at, at school at eighth grade in middle school. And we had heard in our research that one of the things that, one of the things that girls were worried about was smoking. First, we be asked to make smoke a cigarette. Well, marketing people blew a gasket from the show of the dialogue of the game. Whereas I'm saying, you know, we said we'd make these kids where they are. We've made this contact. We want to create stuff that's relevant to their life experience. One thing I learned from that is that the time I wasted taking that personally, that argument, and feeling bad about it, was just stupid. That's not a conversation that I needed to take personally. And luckily, I had a special, I guess, ace in the hole, which was the research that we all got together. So when we had this agreement about whether an issue was important or not, we could say, let us go together and look at the research and come up with an answer uh, that made sense to all of us. So the point is, keep your eyes on the product. The prize is not getting in line with your marketing facts for your engineer. The prize is that person whose life you're trying to make better. The prize is the intervention you're trying to make in popular culture. So this is a choice for you from our first game, Rockets New School, G8 grade girl. What we did here was discover the 
in our research, because we discovered in our research that, that girls at this age have a real problem with a sense of inevitability about the social things that happen to them, uh, they feel very trapped. Oh, I had to go that way. Oh, I knew he didn't make it. I figured I'd do the wrong thing. I'm so happy. I, you know, there's always the sense of inevitability and in the minute. And what we discovered in conversations with them was that what they needed was emotional and nervous space, a way to have different kinds of choices without you know, hardcore social consequences to themselves. So the second uh, series of products that we did uh, was speaking to the inner girl. In, in these products, the secret has the series, uh, the player would go on a quest in, in wild landscapes and solve puzzles to find secret stones that had uh, powers that were needed by one of the characters that they met through the games. So, for example, one of the characters said, I'm so sad my father won't come to the father daughter dance because my parents are divorced. But what can make me feel better? And you can choose to go on a quest for her and get these stones by uh, maturity, um, resilience. Uh, things that would help that character feel better. I have like your own life too. Well, so we launched the company in 1997 at E3. That's my daughter now. I used my three daughters as group games at the show, and actually that daughter also played one of the characters in the game. Um, and it was neat. We were the type, top 500 games of the year. I had to go John Patton football. Um, I'm sorry, top 50 games. <laughs> and there was a lot of traffic to the booth because my kids would go out and say, hey, this kid, you gotta come see this, you gotta come see this. Which actually works better than a woman in a bikini. Um, so we got a lot of people coming to the booth in order to solve them. But then the press started showing up. And this was kind of difficult. On the one hand, the fellow in the New York Times said, well, why do you need special games for girls? Boys don't have special games. And it's like, yes, yeah, it's everything. <laughs> Ideologically minded women are saying, what are these girls doing these awful things to each other? They gossip, well, they, they write stuff about each other in secret books, they, they fight. We don't want girls to be that way, they shouldn't be that way. Okay? Don't take it personally. Any press is good press, right? You may know that you're succeeding by offending the right people in the right place. Your eyes on the prize. The girls were receiving this stuff well. The critics had trouble with it. So uh, we were selling it well. We were beating Disney.com with our website. I think for five months in a row. Well, time in the kids. So we thought we were doing fun. We produced these products, and about five days after we released the last of them, something happened. The board of directors met. One of the mistakes you can make in business is having a board of directors where you're never going to make a difference. We had three people on the side of the Paul Allen venture, and myself and the CEO on the side of our vision. So when the board met, the board told us, surprise, we're shutting down the company. We're shutting down the company because we think the grass is greener on the internet. Because you're selling packaged goods and your market cap can only be at best 10x annual revenue. And we have a saying they can make $2 billion over here. Now they haven't told us how, they don't really have a business plan, but it looks like we're fun with our money, so do a big switch. Oh, look, crazy. I have 50 people sitting there in the lab. You can see this for me. Uh, our investors close our accounts. Uh, my CEO and I said, what are we going to do? Because we remember, we put a deposit down on the real estate we were sitting in, in a different bank than our investors. So we got in the car, raised over the bank, took it all out of cash, and paid everybody their last paycheck or they would have gotten it. And that is how the board paid the cottage. So, there's a couple other things. I, I showed you that sentence for a second. First of all, it's something like that happens. You've got to remember. You haven't had your last good idea. You know? You're the smart guy who thought this up. You haven't had your last good idea. I got this email a couple of days ago. I get email like this two or three times a week from girls. 
mothers, people who play games. Um, 